Hi, everybody. Uh, this is our first lecture to uh, Introduction to Sociology. Uh, this is Sociology 101. Um, my name is Jeremy E. Baker. Today we will be uh, doing a little bit of introducing the course and myself. Uh, we'll be talking about the online classroom. We will go over the syllabus and I will do a little mini lecture on what exactly sociology and social sciences are. Uh, this is the cover of your textbook. Um, textbooks do change uh, their covers once in a while. If yours doesn't look exactly like this, uh, it's not that big a deal. Uh, but it is written by William J. Chambliss. It is also written by Diana uh, Iglitis. And um, that's the general information. It's Discover Sociology 3rd Edition. That's the right one. So, who am I? Uh, my name is Jeremy E. Baker. Uh, my best email is profjebaker at unm.edu. That is the best way to communicate with me. Um, I do, in the syllabus, give a backup email if, for some reason, that email isn't working. Email really is the primary mode of communication with me. I do not have an office on campus. Um, I don't have a phone number that I really pay attention to. Uh, so that's the best way to get in contact with me. Um, I live in Ohio, uh, so that's why I don't have an office. And uh, I, I work entirely online for UNM. Uh, if you want to learn more about me for some reason, uh, my personal website is profjeremybaker.com. I have some things, some little tools for students. You can learn more about me. You can uh, learn about my research Again, if you want to. Um, I teach at UNM Valencia. I teach at UNM Los Alamos. And I also teach uh, in Ohio here at Columbus State. Um, I teach Introduction to Sociology. I teach Criminal Justice and Public Policy. I teach a course on Deviance. I teach a course on Social Problems and a course on Dynamics of Prejudice. I teach all of those for a University of New Mexico. Um, so I guess if you uh, like me for this course, you could look and see if any of those other courses are being taught. My research interests are uh, gender and how we uh, do our gender roles in our society. Uh, I am also interested in non-mainstream religion, uh, so groups outside of what is normally thought of as being religion. And I also have an interest in working class studies. I am an officer for uh, the Working Class Studies Association. Um, yeah. Uh, one note on recordings. Uh, I do, there's a couple background noises you may hear once in a while. I live by the train tracks, so there might be train noises once in a while. Uh, I do have a parrot. Uh, who makes kind of like high-pitched beeping noises now and then. I have a dog, and I live with two small children. Uh, I guess any of those noises could show up. I do my best to try to keep that from showing up on my recordings. But, um, you know, if you hear that stuff, that's what that is. So, now let's go to uh, learn. Uh, also known as Blackboard once in a while, if I ever call it Blackboard, but I know UNM does call it Learn. So I try to call it Learn for you guys. So here we go. And here's more or less what it looks like for you. I'm assuming, well, it, I might not be safe to assume. Uh, this might not be your first semester. Uh, it probably isn't your first semester, but just in case it is, uh, this is what Learn looks like once you get into our online classroom. Um, this is where announcements will normally uh, pop up. Um, keep track of those. I When I make announcements, it's because there's something you need to pay attention to. So please keep track of that. Uh, obviously, I, the first place you should start with the course is the Start Here tab. There's a little bit about me, um, but most importantly, you scroll down to our syllabus, uh, Social 101, Section 503. That's where you can find out everything about the course. 
you can contact me. There's uh, your course text. Um, and then there are things about computer requirements and our course objectives. Other things to note, uh, while we're here in Blackboard, um, here is a link to university libraries. Uh, when we do do writing, uh, this How to Write in Sociology tab gives you brief instruction on how to write for this course. And I think that is incredibly important. Before you write a paper for this course, um, please uh, watch this lecture. It's only about 15 minutes long. It's not that bad. Um, and then uh, one last thing. Well, actually, two last things. Uh, here are your quick links. This will be most of what you use uh, for uh, the course. Here are our discussion boards. You'll find our quizzes, our exercises, our papers, and then our exams. Um, you will use each of those links to access the most critical stuff in the course. And then as the course progresses, and to find this lecture, you would have had to click on week one introductions probably. Um, so obviously you've clicked on this stuff. You got a copy of our syllabus. Um, this looks a little bit differently right now because I am recording this stuff. This is the old lectures. But as the course goes on, so next week, another tab under week one will pop up that says week two. And those will all populate under unit one until we get to our first exam. When we get to past our first exam, they'll start populating under unit two. And then after we take our uh, second exam, it'll populate under unit three. So those will, this list will get longer and longer as the course goes on. So this week, uh, you will participate in our discussion board and you'll also do our orientation quiz. And every week you'll get a to-do list just like this. Uh, so you can uh, take the course. Okay, and I think that's everything you really need to know about Blackboard. Um, I try to, you know, I, I'm assuming you know, kind of know how to use Blackboard, but if you don't, if you have questions, please let me know. Let's look over the syllabus. And again, just like I did with Blackboard, I'm not gonna go over this in too great detail. Uh, this is your syllabus for the course. This is what you need to know to really, you know, be successful for the course. Um, I do not have office hours because I don't live uh, anywhere near you. Um, this course is fully online. We don't meet on campus. Use your email to contact me. Uh, I mentioned this multiple times on the course. If you contact, when you contact me using your UN, using your email, you must use your UNM email. Um, don't use a Gmail account. Do, don't use anything else. It's not because I'm snooty as far as emails go. It's that the system itself sometimes uh, buries emails that aren't UNM emails. So really be aware of that, please. Uh, here, I'm going to glaze over the stuff that I expect you to read on your own. Um, course objectives, that's important. Um, the most important is, yeah, no, they're, they're all very important. That's not what I wanted to talk about. I misspoke, sorry. Um, assessment, uh, item three, grades and grading policies. This is where I lay out how exactly the course is laid out. Um, the most important thing to you is to know that everything matters. There's nothing in the course that you can just not do. Um, courses, uh, students often fail the course because they just don't do stuff. Um, if you do everything, even if you don't do too great at it, if you do everything, you do, should do okay in the course. Um, here are the exact, more exact percentages. Here is how grades are distributed for the course. And then we have uh, my expectations for our discussion posts. Again, I expect you can read these on your own. Expectation on how quizzes work, expectations on exercises, essays. You will be writing a few essays for the course. Uh, I do not grant extra credit. Um, I do 
make every attempt to grade within a week. Um, if I'm not able to grade your work within a week, I do make an announcement. Don't plagiarize. If you do, I'll get you, I promise. Um, course communication, email etiquette. Again, you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with all this stuff. Computer requirements. This is really standard stuff throughout UNM, online learning. Again, there's a lot of stuff from UNM. Uh, it, oh, this is, this is something that's important between me and you. If you have a disability, uh, if you have a documented disability, well, if you have a disability that's not documented, please go uh, talk to student services. If you have a disability that is documented, please let me know as soon as possible uh, because I am legally not allowed to help you with that or um, treat you uh, any differently um, in a way that would help you until you let me know. So please let me know that as soon as possible. Um, okay, here's the course schedule. Here's the stuff that is immediately relevant to your life. Probably the most important thing in the syllabus that you'll look at over and over again. Uh, but this is also laid out in the, um, the to-do list for the week. But it is important to keep track of both of these things. So here in week one, I have it posted that this will go live on Monday, January 14th. And in this first week, I don't have anything listed right here, but you must get your textbook. That's what you have to do in the first week is get your textbook. Participate in discussion one. Uh, put your comment post for discussion one. So in our discussions, you have to make your first post and then two additional comment posts. And if you do that, uh, you should get most of the credit for that. And then do your orientation uh, exercise. Uh, you do all those things, you'll do great for the first week. If you do all these things in the uh, course schedule, you'll do well in the course. Um, and then the rest of this is just, you know, laying out what is happening in the course. Uh, spring break is week nine. We don't do anything on spring break. I think that's something that everyone likes. Um, and then your final will be on, uh, will be due Wednesday, May 8th at 1159 PM. That is a uh, subject to change, but, um, that's, that's pretty solid. Uh, but everything else, um, yeah, that's it for the syllabus. Let me know if you have any questions in that regard. So I already did that. Let, let me, sorry, open this back up to full mode. So uh, let's do a little bit of lecturing at you, right? Um, this is uh, what most of these lectures will look like. It won't really be much jumping between windows. It'll be a little easier to look at than that last bit we just did was. So what exactly is social science? What exactly is sociology? These are questions that almost all students coming into uh, a intro to social course have, uh, mainly because sociology, unfortunately, isn't really a science that is um, emphasized by pop culture, kind of the way that psychology is. Uh, people have a general idea as to what psychology is, namely because of things like CSI or maybe... Um, Silence of the Lambs or any of your Hannibal Lecter spinoffs, right? We know what psychology is. It's, it's you know, sensationalistic study of crazy people. That's not actually what uh, psychology is, but that's what people think it is. Uh, sociology is something a bit different. I'll talk about that in a moment. Sociology is a social science. It is a science. It's absolutely as much of a science as chemistry is. Chemistry is a natural science. They're both sciences because they both use the scientific method. Um, not everything in the world is a science. Uh, English literature, women's studies, history, political science, actually. These are all humanities. Um, they're all valid ways of understanding the social world, but they are not sciences. If something uses the scientific method, it is science. If it doesn't use the scientific method, it is not a science. Uh, and in 
uh, lectures down the road, we'll talk about what exactly the scientific method is. If you've taken a basic, any natural science class, most social science classes, you've talked about the scientific method before. Um, you're most likely at this point in your education to have experienced the scientific method, maybe in a chemistry course, because chemists love to talk about the scientific method. Um, the study of science helps you develop critical thinking. This is why we teach you science, other than maybe if you're going to become a chemist or a sociologist or a physicist. The reason everyday people, day-to-day -day people, business people, social workers need to understand what science is, is to help you think critically and to help you know when pseudoscience is trying to be used to manipulate you, right? Um, especially, um, well, all kinds of reasons, but especially politically. Uh, crit critical thinking is the ability to evaluate claims about truth by using reasoning and evidence. And critical thinking helps you recognize what a poor argument is when somebody doesn't know what they're talking about, when somebody's trying to trick you. Uh, it rejects statements that are not supported by evidence. Climate change is absolutely real. We, we, we know this. This is scientific fact, right? And it's not a matter of opinion. It's absolutely real. There you go. Science. And I can back that up. I can point to the evidence. Um, I don't have the time to do that, but I could if I was required to. If I was writing a paper, I absolutely would put in citations. We'll talk about citations at another point. But critical thinking also questions our assumptions. Um, that's a big part of social science, actually, because up to this point in your life, if you're taking an Intro to Social 101 class, you've probably made a lot of assumptions about the social world because you're a human being. And some of those assumptions are wrong um, because some of my assumptions are wrong, right? What social science does it is, is it helps you to... Um, question those assumptions and figure out what actual reality is to the social world, not just what you, how you think the world works is. Um, and critical thinking, all of this is the basis for scientific thought. This is why science is so great, is because it allows us to get to the actual truth of the matter. So, but there are difficulties that social scientists face that natural scientists don't face. Um, social scientists are subjects or humans, you know, people. Um, people have opinions about their behaviors. Subjects and natural scientists, natural scientists don't. The chemicals don't have an opinion about how they will react to other chemicals and then get angry when they find out how they will react, right? People do that. Um, subjects in natural scientists, sciences don't care what you think. Um, if I drop a weight on the ground and it hits the ground with a certain amount of force, it won't try to please me by hitting it in a different way or um, say, no, I didn't hit it like that. People do stuff like that. Uh, people, when you confront them with by telling them, listen, what you just said, that is racist. People hate being called racist because it's not socially acceptable to be racist in our society, even though many people have subtle, um, subtle racism in them that they aren't aware of. And that makes people angry and that makes people uncomfortable. Um, but it's social reality. Um, subjects in natural sciences are mostly separate and absent from politics. Uh, yes, uh, there are political discussions about things like climate change, things, uh, other, other scientific things that could be uh, talked about in a political way. But those things are not nearly as political as things like race and racism, as things like immigration, as things like um, including uh, women and LGBT people more inclusively in our society. That stuff is heavily political, right? Um, and that is stuff that social scientists study. 
Um, and that can be, make things difficult for us. It doesn't mean we're any less scientific. It just means we're studying things that are controversial. And social scientists, sciences are often seen as soft sciences, as less objective than natural sciences are. Um, and that is, that is entirely a matter of perception. Uh, that's kind of a problem with society that, you know, we just have to deal with as social science scientists. Now, sociology specifically, to separate ourselves from psychology, sociology is the scientific study of social relationships, groups, and societies. We study groups. We study interactions between people. Uh, psychologists um, study what's happening inside one person's brain. That's most of psychology. Sociologists study what happens between people. Um, and that's what we study. We study the interactions that happen between people. We, we use a scientific approach. We use rigorous research methods. And we uh, tend to emphasize social embeddedness. So we like to uh, look at the interactions between people. That's just another way of saying that. Sociology helps you develop what's called the sociological imagination. The sociological imagination is our ability to grasp the relationships between individual lives and the larger social forces that shape them. So how does the stuff that's happening in your life relate to society as a whole, relate to the structures happening in society? Uh, C. Wright Mills, great sociologist, uh, the 1940s, uh, said that the sociological imagination allows us to understand where biography intersects with history, where your story intersects with the greater societal story. Uh, that's the sociological imagination and understanding where that plugs in. An example of this would be an unhappy couple um, and how they interact and what, um, how they are able to resolve their unhappiness. That might have to do with national divorce rates, right? If you get divorced or if you don't get divorced, that really feels very personal if you're in that situation. But there might be national trends that um, interplay on that. Maybe not necessarily they don't interplay on the health of your marriage, but they do interplay on whether you get divorced or not. Is it socially acceptable to get divorced where you are? Well, if it is, then you might get divorced. If it isn't socially acceptable, maybe you might stay in that unhappy marriage for a very long time. Divorce rates were very low in the 1950s. Well, it, was a, it wasn't really legal in many places or less than legal or whatever. Um, it became socially acceptable in the 1980s and then it spiked. So basically, the big picture makes a difference on whether you make your individual decisions. If you would ever lose a job, if you have ever lost a job, um, that can be very um, traumatizing for you as an individual. It makes you feel um, not valuable as a human being. But when you lose a job, um, it might be because a lot of people are losing jobs. It might be because thousands of people are going out of work, right? It might not have anything to do with you. Or if it feels like it has to do with you, it might really have much less to do with you than you actually think. These are, and getting from A to B, getting through that arrow, uh, we can... Um, use the sociological imagination to do that. Now, the sociological perspective is slightly different. The sociological perspective highlights many ways that people influence and are influenced by their social world. It enables us to see the world through a variety of lenses, and it helps us to better uh, picture the issues confronting us locally and globally. And that sounds very similar to the sociological imagination. I would not ask you the difference between those two things on a test, 
but the the way I differentiate between the sociological imagination and the sociological perspective is basically the sociological perspective is you being able to use the terms because this is a very term heavy course, use the terms, use the concept in this course, and then apply that to um, what's happening in your life, applying those concepts to your life. Um, by the end of this course, many students often wind up getting in arguments with people and then using stuff that they've applied from this course. That's using the sociological perspective. I don't want to cause arguments in your life, but, um, but there it is. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to start thinking if, if you're doing this class, right, you're going to start applying stuff to your day to day life. And when you start doing that, um, that, that can be a lot of fun. Well, at least the sociologist thinks that. Another thing we study is what's called structure versus agency. Uh, this is really central to uh, what it means to be a sociologist, is thinking, is this social structure or is this agency? Agency is the ability of individuals and groups to exercise free will and to make social change either on a small or large scale. Um, it's you acting as an individual. That is agency. Now, structure is pattern social arrangements, uh, arrangements that have an effect on agency. Uh, this is structure is the social structure itself. This whole conversation is about whether what you do as an individual is because you're doing it as an individual and you want to, or what you are doing is actually dictated by greater social structures. Um, and this is a lot of what it, what the discipline of sociology is. Um, so for, let me give you an example. Uh, you may have perceived that it was entirely your choice to go to college because you wanted to go to college. Let's, if that's not your case, just imagine it is. Um, but there was other things that dictated you actually going to college other than you wanting to go to college. Could you afford to go to college or take out loans, et cetera, and be able to take out loans? Um, that's not just a matter of you, right? That's a matter of could your parents help you with the money? Could you get a job? Did the economy allow you to get a job to build up that money? Were loans available to you? Is there a college near you or do you have access to a college that can provide online education? Do colleges exist in your society, right? These are all pieces of the social structure that without those pieces, you as an agent, as an individual would not be able to do that stuff, right? So that is how the individual plugs in with structure. And what do I talk a lot about this kind of stuff, if that doesn't make any sense? Finally, uh, for this mini lecture, this is, a sh this is actually shorter than most will be. Sociologists use different levels of analysis to explore our social relationships. Uh, these uh, levels of analysis are usually broken into micro level and macro level. Micro sociology examines small group interactions to see how they impact larger institutions in society. Macro sociology examines large scale social structures to determine how they impact groups and individuals. So micro level is looking at how a couple people interact. Macro level is looking at how thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people interact. And then there is an in-between level, right? Where it's not quite huge, but not quite small. We sometimes call that the meso level. Um, but it's almost always talking about micro or macro and then sometimes in meso. Uh, but those are the three levels of size and sociology we usually talk about. And I think that is about as much as is um, needed to, you know, for an introduction to the course. Go on to Blackboard and look at the rest of the things we have listed to do this week. Uh, consult your syllabus, get used to the course, let me know if you have any questions, and I will talk to you soon.